to welcome all of you to today's class with an Islamic greetings which is <coughs> which means may peace, mercy, and blessings of God be with all of you. That's what it is. In the name of God, we seek His help and we seek His forgiveness. Whose of God guides is none and his guide. Whosoever God misguides is none and guide. The best of speech is a speech of God. And the best of actions are actions of the prophet. And the worst of speech is a speech of the devil. And the worst of actions are actions of the God. I welcome all of you, brothers and sisters, for the subject, Miracles of Al Quran. Now, before we start, I just like to make a note that if any of you have prior appointments and you cannot stay for the whole course, feel free to go. You don't have to feel uncomfortable. So, if you have things in between, you can just walk quiet. Right? So, don't feel embarrassed or don't feel uncomfortable. Now coming to the miracle, you see there is a statement in the Quran which says inna nahnu nazalna dhikra wa inna lahu which means we verily, it is we without any doubt send this message, the book, the Quran. And it is upon us that we are surely will protect it. So this is a statement God Almighty puts it in the Quran. He says that it was him who revealed this book and it is upon the creator to protect this book. And it stands still today that Quran has been preserved and protected as it was first revealed to Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, in the 7th century. Till today. Now, before we head back into the tributes non-Muslim scholars, non-Muslim thinkers give to the Quran, I would like to take you to the time of the Prophet himself. In the time of the Prophet Muhammad, he was an Ummi man. He was an unlettered prophet. Unlettered means a person who cannot write or read. And in the Arabic word when you say Ummi, it has a much deeper meaning. In Arabic, um means mother. So when you say um me, the, the state of the person is as ignorant as he was born. You see the difference. When we say unlettered in English, it does not carry the deep sense that the Arabic letter carries. When you say um me, the person is as illiterate as he was the day he was born. So Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was a man, not only him, bulk of his community was not people of learning. They don't have, they're not known for great universities or great writings or great learning. They were people who lived in the desert and we know today desert is one of the toughest environments to live. Till today. Despite we have so much of sophisticated technology, still it is one of the toughest places on the planet. So you can imagine in the 7th century how life must have been. It must have been miserable. It was a tribal society. No certain laws. The larger is your family hold, you have great or more sons, you are well protected. The stronger is your tribe, you are protected. If you are deprived of both this, then you are unprotected. There is no police department, there is no military or governance to govern individuals or communities. So that is how the setup is. So I need to take you back to the 7th century so you can imagine the situation in Arabia was. Now during this time, when Prophet Muhammad received his first revelation at the age of 40, when he was telling people, of course, he was met with hostility. He was met with uh, criticism. He was tormented. His followers were even executed. They were killed. So these are recorded history. Apart from that, the very people who went against his message 
actually gave tribute to the Prophet and to conduct the Prophet Muhammad. See, they went against him, but they had a worldly reason to go against him. It was nothing to do with the spiritual reason. They couldn't prove that Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad, peace be, peace be upon him, was any evil person. They couldn't prove that. It was beyond a shadow of doubt that even when he claimed prophethood, they would give him the things to keep it in his house as a safekeeping. Right? Uh, just bear with one more. Right? Chase coming, sorry. Yeah? So, so they, uh, so that, those people at the time, even uh, when he claimed prophet, despite the fact they were hostile to him, they still considered him to be the most trustworthy person in the community. A person who is not known for lying, a person who returns back the belonging of other people when it's entrusted to them. So these are the names that Muhammad personally, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, had even before he became a prophet. And also the message. You see, the Quran was so unique to these others. Because it was speaking in their language, but far superior than anything they know. So we have during the time of Prophet Muhammad at night, he would start praying the night prayers. Right? There's a night prayer which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, used to pray. And you know, at night it's usually calm, it's quiet because everybody's asleep, no transportation, nothing. It's, it's a very quiet moment. So what Prophet would do, he would pray. While he prayed, he would read the Quran loud. And then we have people like Abu Jahl, who was a hardcore enemy of Islam, who was persecuting the Muslims right and left, humiliating the Prophet, and did all type of harm to him and to his family and to his followers. And then we have Abu Sufyan, who in a later stage embraced Islam, but this was an earlier stage. And then we have Anak ibn Surak. These three people would sneak in outside the house of Prophet Muhammad. Peace be upon him. And they would listen to the Quran. And each one did know each one was standing there and listening. So they would listen to the Quran and then they will, as soon as they bump into each other, they say, what are you doing here? They said, okay. And then they make a promise. Okay, tomorrow we don't come here anymore. And the next night, they come back again to listen to the recitation of the Quran by the Prophet. That is how attractive it was to these people, despite the fact they opposed the message. So on the third day, it takes place. So on the third day, they make a promise. All three of them make a promise that we don't come back again to listen to this recitation anymore. So they don't come. But Anak, one of the person who was with them actually no. poses a question to Abu Sufya. Abu Sufya, tell me, what do you think about this recitation? This Quranic recitation. And Anak says, I can't deny the fact this has to be from God Almighty. Because a man who couldn't speak or write, which we knew since his childhood, now speaks with beautiful words, eloquency, the highest level of uh, intellectual approach in this book. So they were talking and then they acknowledged that this has to be from the Creator Himself. This has to be the divine speech. And then both of these people, Anak as well as Abu Sufyan, approached Abu Jahl. So they asked him, Abu Jahl, what do you think about this recitation? So Abu Jahl said, of course this is the word of God. Acknowledgement that this Quran is the word of God, despite the fact all three of them oppose the message of the Quran. But Abu Jahl had a reason. He said, look, whenever the tribe of Muhammad used to compete in charity, we used to do the same, give more charity so we can equally compete with them. When they used to fight in the battlefield with courage, like courageous man, we used to equally compensate. Now, where am I going to bring a book as beautiful as this book that this man is reading? 
or in our recite, uh, recitation that he is reading. So I deny. So the only reason he gave for denying Prophet's message was not, it was not true, but it was personal ego. Pride. I should accept his message. He's no better than I am. But it is God. He chooses whom he wills to deliver the message. It could be anybody. The very people we look down upon, we have seen how they come above our head. That is the way God works. The nations we look down upon today, tomorrow they will be sitting on our heads and ruling us. That's how the cycle of life works. So the tributes given to the Quran today, apart from the tributes given during the revelation itself, we have great thinkers in the non-Muslim world who give us these tributes. Reverend R. Bosworth, Smith in his book, Muhammad and Muhammadinism. That's a long term, but we don't use that anymore. During the British occupation, during their time, they used to say Mohammedanism, thinking that Muslims worship Muhammad, which is not true. So he says a miracle of purity of style, of wisdom, and of truth. He's a reverend. He's a Christian reverend. This is a tribute he gives to the Quran. And then we have Aja Arbery in his English translation of the Quran. He says, Whenever I hear the Quran chanted, have you heard Quran being recited? Trust me, even you don't understand it, when I play it on, even non-Muslims get moved. I had a scholar in Australia, he saw in the campus some Christian missionary, you know, college goers. They were standing there giving out the British Christian publications. So he went up to them, he said, I'm going to read to you something. Of course, these people had no idea about Arabic or Quran or anything in Arabic. So he read to them a simple Arab poem. They heard it. They said, nice. And then he read the Quran to them. And they were amazed. And they said to the scholar, the second recitation was amazing. What is that? That doesn't look like earthly language. The same Arabic. First, he read a normal poem written by any writer. They were, okay, nice. But as soon as he read the Quran, they were amazed. They asked him, what is this speech? This looks very heavenly. This doesn't look very earthly. Then he said, this is the Quran. And this is a testimony from people who had no idea the man is reading Arabic or he's reading something from the Quran or some Arabic poem. This is a test testimony given by people who have no idea what this Quran is. And I have repeatedly seen, every time I quote the Quran in Arabic to my Christian friends about the birth of Jesus Christ, I can see tears in their eyes. Despite they don't understand what I'm reading, but as soon as I translate it to the sisters here, as soon as I translate to them, they seem to understand. But nevertheless, without that, so that's what this person is saying. Whenever I hear the Quran chanted, it is as though I am listening to music. Underneath the flowing melody, there is sounding all the time the extensive beat of drum, of a drum, the continuous beat of the drum. It is like the beating of the heart. So this is the man who did the translation of the Quran. And then we have Cat Stevens. How many of you have heard of this person called Cat Stevens? You know, he is a Michael Jackson of the 70s. True, if you have seen his biography, he's Michael Jackson of the 70s. So our fathers must have listened to him like we must have listened to Michael Jackson. Today I don't know who's famous. After Michael Jackson's device, I don't follow the music industry. So he says everything makes so much sense. This is the beauty of the Quran. It, it asks you to reflect a reason. This is one of the very unique things that Quran is constructed upon. Quran doesn't speak to us like it talks like a storybook. Once upon a time, there was Cinderella. It doesn't go that way. The way Quran talks is very unique. Its approach is not like any other scripture or any other man written book. So here it says, it makes sense, and it takes, it makes you to reflect. And then, when I read the Quran further, talked about prayer, kindness, charity. I was not a Muslim yet. So he was not a Muslim yet. 
But I felt that the only answer for me was the Quran and God has sent it to me. You see, how he got acquired the Quran was, he wasn't feeling well. He was in the hospital when somebody actually, his brother, went into a bookstore and he bumped into this Quran because he knew Cass Stephen had a habit of reading. So he just fetched it. He didn't even know what he bought. He just bought and just gave it to him. And he started to read. And the first chapter he read was chapter Yusuf. Yusuf was what in a biblical uh, Joseph. Joseph. Chapter Joseph. And till today he tells in an interview, till today if I read this chapter, I still cry and I still feel I'm reading it for the first time. Because chapter Yusuf is nothing but patience. It's all about patience and he struggled since his childhood. Separated from his father at a very young age and grew up just a few kilometers or miles away from his father but was hidden away from his father. And went through struggle in the house of the Aziz, the one who was looking after him. At that time a king and was abused and accused for a thing that he didn't do. Then eventually God elevates him and makes him the decision maker in the process of his kingdom and then eventually he unites back to his family. So it's all about struggle. So that's where he was touched. And then we have T.B. Hulk's Dictionary of Islam. He says, however often we turn to it, the Quran, at first disgusting us each other. Is that right? Yeah. Disgusting us each other afresh. It soon attracts at sounds and in the end enforces our reverence. See, this is his review. That's what he says, Dictionary of Islam. He says, it's style, the Quranic style in accordance with its content and aim its turn, grand, terrible, ever and now true sublime. And thus this book will go on exercising through all ages and most potent influence. These are not Muslims, except for Cat Stevens, who became a Muslim later. These are not Muslims. And this is a tribute they give to God. Even today, Hillary Clinton's daughter, if you've seen her interview, we give, she gives great tribute to the Quran. She's doing a lot of intensive research in Islam. She's been very younger, but she's been doing it for past 10 years now. So these are the people who have given tributes to her. Now, coming to the subject of what is a miracle, let me define what is a miracle. By definition, miracle according to Oxford Dictionary means an extraordinary and welcome event believed to be the work of God. Another definition is an outstanding example or achievement. And according to Webster Dictionary, it says an extraordinary event manifesting divine intervention in human affairs. This is, by definition, what it means, a miracle. Now, an analogy. Let me give you a simple analogy so you can, you can understand what a miracle is. If, for example, if a person is dead, lying flat here dead, certified by medical doctors that this man is dead, his pulse are down, his pulse are not there, his heartbeat stopped. So he's dead. But a person comes along and he says, in the name of God, wake up. And he wakes up. Certified by a medical doctor that this person is dead. And that person comes, another person comes and says, wake up in the name of God. And he wakes up. Now that is a miracle. Am I correct? Do you follow? Now, what makes a greater miracle is, for example, a person is dead, certified dead, put in a sepulchre. You know what's a sepulchre? You know what is a sepulchre? It's where, I don't know how many of you come from Christian background, you know when Jesus was crucified, they put him inside a rock where there's bed, usually people used to have this as farm houses in the olden days. So it's basically a rock carved in where there's bed, something like a small living room, that's called sepulchre. 
So if a person is kept over there for three days, dead, certified dead, three days is no breathing, there's nothing, it's dead, he's completely gone. A righteous person comes along and he says, wake up in the name of God. And this man wakes up. That is a greater man. So in principle, the greater the impossibility, the greater the law. You understand the definition now? I hope because I need to move forward with your understanding. You all understand what a miracle is. So the greater the impossibility, the greater the law. So Quran is indeed a miracle of all miracles ever known to man. That's what I'm going to do today. We're going to examine how it is a miracle. Because words are easy to say. I can make claims, but I have to back it up. Claims are easy. This hot air is nothing. But I need to back it up. So we're going to analyze with our own eyes, with our own intellect, how this scripture that came down to Prophet Muhammad in the 7th century can be put to examination today using modern science. Like for example, in the time of Jesus, people believed in what? Medicine. So God sends Jesus Christ, may peace be upon him, with a miracle that he brought people back to life. Am I correct? Anybody coming from a Christian background will know that. He gave life to someone who's dead. To prove to his people, this is not the doings of Jesus, rather it was coming from God Almighty. So people may believe in the message. And in the time of Moses, there were people who believed in magic. Magic was the yardstick. So Moses, may peace be with him, was given a greater miracle of splitting the sea, of splitting the river. And he threw the rod and became a snake, a serpent. So he can prove to the people he is a messenger of God. And in the time of Muhammad, peace be upon him, the claim was the language. The boast is the language. The Arabs were boasting, except for the Arabs, everyone else was as good as animals. You were not intelligent people. This was the claim. And that was the boast. So Quran comes with the most eloquent language in their own language, it challenges them. That's why I put here, at the age of the Quranic revelation, Arabs excelled in poetry, philosophy, and prose. So Muhammad's main miracle, the Quran, challenged them by its eloquence. And then, so that, just as it offered convincing proof to people of the past, it may do the same to the people of today and for people to come in the future. And then the miraculous feature of the Quran are not confined to its linguistic inamilability, in, in one of the miraculous features of the Quran lies in ever-expanding nature of the meaning contained in its verses and their inexhaustible capacity to accommodate even the most recent scientific discoveries. In the Quran we are told we have what, 6,300 or 6,666 verses in total and 2,000 of them deals with modern science. Out of the 6,666 verses, 6, 6, 000, how much? 6,236 6, 6, verses, 2,000 deals with what we have just discovered in the modern science. With all the sophisticated technology we have discovered in very recent times. So that's what we are going to examine. Now, Miracle number one. We go to the historical miracle. You see in the Quran, there is a verse where God is talking about the Pharaoh. How many of you heard about this person called Pharaoh? Good. It's in Egypt. In the Quran, he is a symbol of evil. And Moses, the symbol of evil. There is not a tyrant that ruled the earth as Pharaoh did. Because he owned everything. He owned his, his people, 
he owned the land, the kingdom was his. So that was how powerful he is. And the Quran also says, this man, Pharaoh, actually the Pharaoh claimed to be God. He told his people, I don't see any God but me. I don't see any, any God but me. That is how authoritative he was. And his statement was never contested. It was never challenged by his people. They accepted it as it is. So that shows you the authority he had over his people. For him to make such a claim is not easy. If today somebody comes and put, comes on the TV and says, I'm your God, do you agree to that? Even if you don't believe in God, even you're an atheist, you will take him for a challenge. Right? At that time, so that shows his authority. But with that authority, he did nothing but a possible. And Pharaoh said, O Haman, build me a lofty palace that I may attain the ways and means. He wanted his, Haman happens to be his chief engineer, his right hand, who's, you know, building brick construction. And I believe the one who has studied uh, Pharaoh history, you know how they built the pyramids. The pyramid is an amazing structure. Because at that time, they had no wheels. Wheel was not discovered at that time. Yet, those rocks, it's not built by small bricks, it's like huge rocks. So the question still today, great you know, people of very who study historical is history, they have the question, how did these people move these rocks? And